This program is brought to you by Dodge Truck, the official vehicle of the In Fisherman Communications Network. When in 1881, Dr. D.A. Henschel described the smallmouth bass by saying it was inch for inch and pound for pound the gamest fish that swims, he was likely referring to this species in its most natural environment, rivers. Indeed, when a big shouldered bronze back has the current to assist it in its struggle against the line and rod of a would-be captor, it's hard to deny that the power generated by the four pounds or so worth of critter is disproportionate to its actual size. Yes, it's difficult to believe that a relatively small fish can fight that long, hard, and dramatically. Quarters, maybe five pound fish. A package of dynamite. It is often overlooked that the smallmouth bass is a fish of rivers in its natural state. It has been transplanted to lakes and reservoirs across the country. But to understand the smallmouth fully is to understand it in its most natural environment. While smallies seldom display long distance movement in most lakes and reservoirs, such is not the case in rivers. Smallmouths are constantly on the move as water conditions change. It's not simply a matter of moving where they're most comfortable. In some cases, failure to move could be lethal. The key to catching smallmouth bass consistently in their river environment is to know how they move seasonally and in response to changing water levels. That's what this video is all about. In Fisherman classifies rivers in the following geologic age groups. Very young, young, adult, mature, middle-aged, old, very old, and tidal. View a stream by stretches. A particular stretch can be young, old, or somewhere in between. For instance, a stream might be quite shallow, have a slow taper for several miles, and possess a number of backwater areas with soft bottom and aquatic weed growth. Crappies and largemouth bass find adequate habitat here. Suddenly, this same stream might break through a rocky, cliff-like area, creating a rapids, and finally pouring into a boulder-based pool. This stretch could hold smallmouth bass. Different stretches of the same stream can have different personalities and different fish species. Rarely is a stream the same from beginning to end because few regions are geographically consistent. Because of these limitless variations, we devise the following method of classifying streams. With these categories, you can identify and recognize most river stretches in North America. Of course, there are exceptions. Parts in transition are like a natural lake that has eutrophic bays, while the main body of the lake is mesotrophic. This chart shows the species present in each river category. Notice how a fish's numbers peak and then gradually decrease as the river evolves. Each aging stage favors certain varieties of cold, cool, or warm water species. Young picturesque mountain trout streams may be unpolluted and unaffected by man. These streams are infertile since they run over rock beds and gain few nutrients from the land. Very young and young streams cannot support large fish populations. Cold water species disappear in the adult stage. In sections with less gradient, the water flows slower and warms to a temperature that trout cannot survive. This environment favors cool water fish like smallmouth bass. In the mature stage, Cool water fish like walleyes, saugers, pike, and muskies enter the picture. Then, as a river gets older, the cool water species begin to fade. Warm water fish like largemouth bass and catfish become dominant, and fish like carp become common. Coming out of the tough winter period when smallies are sequestered in deep holes in a state of near hibernation, 
the spring sun's warming rays germinate a movement towards shallower shelves that will serve as spawning beds. This can be a great time to stalk the smallmouth as he moves along predictable aquatic pathways. There's one. Whoa! Ah, right on the curve. Hey, that's it. Come here, baby. Pretty fish. Pretty fish. Got him. That is one beautiful smallmouth bass. And that's typical of the fish you can catch on a lot of rivers all throughout the country. And spring is actually one of the best times to catch them. Although it can be a little bit of a challenge because they're really concentrated. If you can find the spots where they are, boy, you can really clean up like gangbusters. That fish was sitting right on the current break up there. You know, like, uh, like lake smallmouth, River smallmouths can be extremely concentrated in the springtime. But unlike the lake smallmouth, the spots that they use are very seldom obvious. At least I don't think that they are. You can go for miles and miles of river and not find much for smallmouths, and then all of a sudden find them packed into a subtle little spot and then really clean up on them. And if you just follow a couple of general principles, I think you'll know, you'll have a good idea what it takes to catch smallmouths in the springtime. Rather than running up the tributary little rivers that flow into the big river or going back into the backs of bays or lagoons, uh, spring smallmouth areas tend to be out and main river oriented. And you're often talking subtle, subtle points or the, the tail ends behind islands, often very small spots where you've got a little bit of slack current uh, meeting the main flow of the river. So you're not way, way back in a slack water area. You can see the area that I'm fishing here is just a subtle little point got a little bit of wood cover and the current flows alongside that little eddy or that comp spot. And this is a real classic spot for spring smallmouths. They'll stack up and spawn actually in that area, the calmer water, just adjacent to the current. Now you can see all of the little ripples out here that are caused by a rock plane. And this is probably more classic summer water. The spring smallies are probably going to be tucked up on the inside a little bit. The rocks break the current flow and it forms a good little calm water uh, spawning area in the back. Couple casts in the riffles. And I really want to concentrate my cast up in the calm water adjacent. Perfect. There's one. Right on the current seat. Nice bass. Big smolly. Whew. Come on up, baby. There we go. Well, I bet you that fish wasn't five feet separate from what it other was. Big bass in a small spot. You find that spot, you're going to have some major league fun. Oh, and they fight in the current? Beautiful fish. Ah, he tossed one hook. He tossed both hooks. That's okay. Save me the trouble of unhooking them. Get another one. You can go up and down miles of river casting all the likely looking spots like this with a fast moving bait like a crankbait. And the whole key is to find the first smallmouth that zeroes you into that area. And in general, you'll find that uh, it's not a real clean, bright bottom like pure sand but it's usually got some darker debris in the bottom it's kind of a darker bottom so the fish blend in so they're not so visible to attack by birds or or by prey like man and there's usually a little bit of cover and it's uh, it's a good bottom where they can sweep out a nest later on adjacent to the river adjacent to food and just out of the current the whole key when you're first starting out is to find fish that's why I'm using the shallow running crankbait. I'm only dealing with depths that are about one and a half to four feet deep, and I have to cover a lot of likely looking spots to zero in on those areas where the fish are concentrated. And then once I find them, I can slow down and fish with a jig or a little spinner bait or fly rod, something like that. Anything that'll, that'll catch smallmouth. 
Okay, we're through the riffle. I'm going to pick up and run down to that next little point down there, see if there's any bass around. This whole section is a relatively soft bank with weed growth that's beginning to flood with the spring high water. And it doesn't really have anything in particular to hold the bass in this area. Uh, the current is brushing right ac across the face of the, the weeds and uh, there's nothing to break the force of it, so I'm just going to pass right on through. In most lakes, smallmouths are predictable homebodies that remain within limited areas all year long. But rivers are a different story. Water levels change quickly and drastically with rain and runoff. Strong currents blow fish out of areas one day and threaten to leave them high and dry the next. River smallmouths usually have no choice but to remain mobile. Recent radio tracking studies show that smallmouth bass can be either migratory or homebodies in river environments, depending on the available habitat. One study done on the Huron River in Michigan showed that smallmouth bass wintered, spawned, and summered in confined areas if suitable habitat existed. Fish weren't forced to move long distances by changing conditions. In a study on the Wolf River by the Wisconsin DNR, smallmouth bass wintered in deep river sections and then moved to a small feeder river, the Embarrass River, to spawn and set up summer home ranges. Individual fish tended to return to the precise spots where they spent the previous summer. Amazingly, these fish traveled between 22 and 68 miles each year to reach their preferred seasonal habitat. You know, in some cases, these guys might be able to spawn pretty close to their wintering habitat, but in other rivers, they may have to actually move miles to find a suitable spawning site. It really all depends on what's available in the river you're fishing. Boost that motor and get back up there. The water's usually a little bit higher and darker in the spring, so you usually wind up fishing tight to the shoreline, and using baits that are bright or flashy, like spinner baits with gold blades or crawfish or chartreuse patterned uh, crank baits, things like that, things that are easier for the fish to see. If it was real low and clear like you get in summertime, you could use things that are a little more naturally colored. Another great smallie. Spring River smallmouths. Definitely an opportunity you want to take advantage of. folks two hours ago I was sitting back at the office and I looked at uh, my desk and it was about two feet deep in paperwork and I was about eight eight phone calls behind and I just looked at the clock and I said I'm going fishing heading out to a river and just look at this fish boy look at the chest on that guy that's how come these river fish are so powerful they've got so much right through there so much swimming power what a beautiful fish there you go. Ah, 
Well, I love to fish smallmouth during the summertime, especially when you get out in a river like this and you don't have a whole lot of competition for the fish. What you're looking for, I think, during the summertime, especially when you're after, when you're searching for big smallmouth bass, is you gotta wait until the water draws down. You know, when you got high water, the fish are sometimes pushed up against the banks early in the year, but when the water gets drawn down, the smallmouth bass may hold in pool areas when they're inactive, but when they're really active and up and chasing crayfish, they're gonna be, get up on big rock flats interspersed with boulders maybe to uh, slacken the current just a little bit. So I guess that tells you a lot about what we're going to be doing right here. We're going to be throwing crawfish pattern baits for, for the most part and baits like uh, uh, rattle baits for example, baits that you can cast far and cover a lot of area with. And I'll tell you what, that was a mighty nice fish that I just had, but I'm betting that there's bigger fish out here than that one. Free-flowing rivers are composed of a continuous series of riffles, holes, and runs or flats. The size of these elements are proportionate to the size of the river. In a small trout stream, a hundred-yard section may contain many riffles, holes, and flats. In a big river, on the other hand, a mile section may contain only a few such riffles, holes, or flats. Generally, during midsummer, Active river fish, smallmouth bass, catfish, walleyes, and muskies tend to hold where current naturally brings food to them. These areas are in or near fast-moving riffled areas, the head areas of holes, or faster-moving flats with cover, such as rocks or logs. During inactive periods, fish move away from current areas to hold in deeper, slacker water. The amount and placement of cover, like boulders or fallen logs, dictate where fish hold. For example, active smallmouths would roam all over this fast water riffle area. But when inactive, they'll probably hold behind boulders. During an intense cold front, smallmouths would probably move into the deeper hole. There's one back there. Way back on that flat. I can't tell how big he is. Whoa. Another horse. Yeah, that fish isn't quite as big as I thought he was. Well, look at here. Here, I want to show you something. See how he took that bait? He took that bait head first. You know, these guys are feeding on crayfish. And... <clears throat> That's oftentimes how the way they'll take a crayfish, especially when the crayfish gets in a de defensive position. You know, the crayfish is there and he's got his claws here and he's head first at the smallmouth bass. And they're used to grabbing those craws right by the head. And they do the same thing, of course, when the, the craw goes up and he goes backwards. So you want to make sure you have the both sets of hooks on your, on your plug as sharp as you can get them. And that fish was about, oh, certainly at the end of the cast away. So you just got to set and hold on. And I get your line all tangled up like that. Just got to be covering lots of water. Now this section of the river right here is about oh, a foot and a half to two feet deep over the top. And so that's the reason for that shallow one running rattle bait. Of course the, uh, oh, I don't know if that was a fish or not. The reason for the rattle bait there's, no, there's one right here. Ah. <laughs> I got them all over here. The reason for the rattle, as I was telling you, is it kind of warns the fish that something's coming. You know, these fish are real active. And, uh, of course, vision is the main thing, the main uh, sense that they're going to use to actually feed. But that rattle tells them that there's something coming. It gets them prepared to strike something. I'll tell you, a bass can swim at about 12 miles an hour. And that's at least four times faster than you could ever reel a crankbait. So when the fish get really charging in the summertime, you don't have to worry about speed. Really classic looking summertime smallmouth spot. At this great big riffle area, the fish come up through the riffle and get right at the head of these things. There's one right there. There's one. A little guy, a little guy. You know those smallmouths, they come up through the riffle and they start running crayfish over this big flat, the head of the riffle area. Well, even those little guys are powerful fish. Boy, are they all muscle. Holy smokes. 
Oh, I had another fish follow me up right here. <laughs> Let's see if he'll come back again. Now, so often that's the case with smallmouths. One will hit, and they'll just follow each other. Take the, uh, apparently they take the crayfish away from one another a lot of times. Anyway, there was another fish here. There's one. Whoa, big fish. That I like. And he's running upstream. Oh, you just barely keep up with him. So far in this video, we've followed the smallmouth bass out of winter and through her spring patterns, and we've talked in a general sense about summer location. Now, it's time to key in on some prime summertime areas, specific locations that are dictated by current or the lack thereof. We join Dan Sura knee-deep in smallies. Oh, Rats! It's summertime, and the smallmouth bass action is red hot. Take a look at rivers all across the United States. You find hard-bottomed rivers like this with smallmouth bass populations. During the summer, under low and normal water conditions, these fish are going to scatter out in the flats. Now, most folks are familiar with the fact that during high water, fish relate to current breaks in the quieter water areas, oh, maybe behind bridge abutments and boulders and... Uh, uh, tree stumps and so forth, but during the summer when the current is low slack water type areas exist all over the river The fish scatter and the prime place to find them is in these mid-river areas in areas that we call pushes It's an area directly behind maybe a little bit of a scoop out hole where the depth changes and the water gets pushed up It forms a cushion the smith the fish will nose in there and as the bait tumbles downstream They're gonna nail it now. I'm fishing a straight shafted spinner and I'm gonna work it right along the face of that push Okay, the idea is to quarter cast, you fire it out there, engage the reel, and let the line and the lure just sweep downstream, let the current pick it up and float it right, and just carry it right along the front face of that push. That's where the fish are located, and the idea is to maximize your fishing time by keeping that lure in that prime position as long as possible. You don't want to retrieve, you want to just ma maneuver the rod left, right, and maybe retrieve slightly as the lure works its way back towards, towards your casting position. Now, you don't have to make long casts. The important thing here is not the length of the cast, it's to control the lure to keep it in that fish zone. That's where the small mice are on the front edge. There's a... Oh, yeah! Oh, wow! Come on, come on! Oh. Toe to toe! Well, I'll tell you, nothing, absolutely nothing, fights harder than a broad-shouldered, scrappy, summertime <laughs> river smallmouth bass. I'll take them over anything that swims. Boy, nothing fights harder than these critters. Come on. Yeah. <laughs> well, I love them. I just love them. Reach in for my trusty disgorger here. There you go. <laughs> How's that? Whoa! A package of dynamite. Back you go. Back you go. You know, I'm using a straight shafted spinner for this situation, but there's a bunch of other lures that'll work too. Other effective lures for river smallmouth are crayfish imitating crankbaits. For aggressive smallies, try topwater lures such as propeller baits or floating rapalas. For neutral and negative fish, Use a 1 8 or 1 quarter ounce jig with a grub or a 4 inch plastic worm. Fish them slow and on the bottom. These lures can all be fished using the same technique as the spinner. Quarter them on the upstream side of any object that deflects current and in push areas. Push areas are located in the very end of a tail out section of a hole just before the water breaks onto a shallow riffle area. The reason fish hold here is the bottom change that creates the riffle restricts the water flow and produces a cushion of slower water on the upstream face that makes a perfect place for smallmouth to feed. How do you find these spots? Well, look for the telltale bulge of water. 
Now the prime area is the flat, slick water just upstream from the bulge. That's smallmouth country. Just sweep that lure right along the face of the push. There! Ah, smallmouth, I love them. Ow! Oh, yeah! Oh, this is a pig! Oh, yeah! Holy moly, did you see the size of that fish? This is a pig! Oh! Oh, man! You know, you want to use about 8-pound test line, you get into some of these 3-pound three, three plus smallmouth bass, and you've got to lean on them in this current. They use that current very, very efficiently. Oh, man, whoa, look at that. Beautiful, beautiful smallmouth bass. Whoa, not quite ready yet. Come on, girl. Come on. Oh, oh yeah. Grab that smallmouth very carefully by the lip. Again with that disgorger. Huh? That's another one. Come on. You know, one thing you've got to understand with these push areas, it's not like a small current break. You could have 20 or 30 fish working the front of this thing. These are active fish, and they're in there foraging minnows, crayfish, insects, whatever. They're in there, and they're chewing. We're going to take advantage of that. Oh, yeah. Right in that same, oh, right in that same area. Hit that other fish. Whoa, whoa, whoa. Whoa. Oh, come on. Oh, man. Oh, what I tell you? These fish will get in here and they'll stab. Look at that power in that fish. Oh. What I tell you? What I tell you? You'll get numbers of fish holding in these push areas. They're really productive. Oh. Oh. Fish. What'd I tell ya? How's that for a smallmouth bass? You like him yanking on your string? Oh, beautiful hot summer action. What'd I tell ya? Fish the pushes. Let the other people have a lot of these maybe productive areas that they fished earlier in the year. When it comes to summer smallmouth, mid river areas and pushes. That's the key. Treat smallmouth bass like you would any other valuable resource. And in most cases, we practice catch and release for smallmouth bass. As summer and its relative comfort slips into the cooler autumn period, smallmouth bass begin to position themselves to survive the impending cold water period. Oftentimes, this means long distance migrations. We join Jim Lindner and Matt Straw as they too were on the move if for slightly different reasons. There he is, Jim. That one? Got another one. Whoa, oh, nice fish. Nice fish. Right there. That's a good one there. Good small. We're snouting these lures. They're active. We hit them just right today. This is a perfect day. Oh, man. Oh. All right, there he is. Man, this is the kind of fish you can get in the fall when these fish start to migrate. I'll tell you what we're doing today, folks. We're intercepting these fall smallmouths on their annual migration. They're moving toward deeper, slower water where they're going to spend the winter. And it's, an, it's a pretty predictable phenomenon. And this is the kind of fish you can find grouped up. They're doing the same things they do in the summertime. They're near current, they're spending a lot of time near fast water right now, but they're getting closer to the spaces where they're going to spend the winter. Hey, these are nice fish, and there's a lot of them here. We're going to get a few more. We happen to be fishing around a dam right now, which holds a lot of fall smallmouths, but there's a number of other areas in the river that'll really concentrate these fish also. The key to catching river smallmouths in fall is understanding that they need deep, slow water to winter in as their body temperature and energy levels decrease. In a given stretch of river from dam to dam, when the water temperature reaches the low 60s, smallmouths migrate from flat, riffly water to areas in close proximity to deep holes. They also move from shallow feeder streams to the deeper main river. In addition, you will see a pronounced movement toward deep water near the dams both upstream and down. 
Until cold water sets in, 48 degrees and colder, fish prefer the type of structure they used in summer, shallow shoals, boulders that break current, and even wood. The best structure is very near the deep water areas they will drop into when winter finally arrives. There's one, Matt. Whoa! You got him? Yeah. Way back in that push back there. Come here, baby. Whoa! <laughs> that current's fun, isn't it, John? Come here, that's a beautiful fish. Look at that. It's tied up there. Come here. You gotta sort of watch them with these crankbaits. Oh, there we go. Look at the size of that bull. That's a big smallmouth. You know, smallmouths don't have to make big migrations. Some fish, if all the habitat is available, will spawn winter and summer within a, you know, a couple miles of a river section. But in some cases, like we're in here, the fish have actually made 30, 40 mile movements throughout the course of a year. Better get her back. Go on, baby, get ready. Ooh! There he is, Jim. Look at that. Another one. We're into him, I'll tell you, buddy. We're into him. Fish was really, really thick up. in here. Another ball. <laughs> Man. Oh, he's a bulldog. Just hanging down there. Come here, buddy. All we want to do is let you go. I'll tell you, they're jumping around here. There's some nice fish in here. Okay. Oh, there he is. Look at this. These fish are really hot right now. When they first move in, when these fall migrating fish are first moving into these areas, the water's warm and they're hot. They're going to take fast moving aggressive presentations like crankbaits and spinnerbaits and spinners. And they're holding near deep water where they're going to winter. They're going to be holding in deeper areas, around deeper areas, but the aggressive fish are going to be up on areas that they're similar areas to the areas they use in the summer, near riffles, pushes, gravel bars, they're going to come up shallower to feed. Oh man, there's a lot of these guys in there. These fish are really active, they're up in those hot current areas. You know, they're actively moving. Oh, there's another one. There's another one right there. Oh, out of the water. Big air. Oh man, these guys are talking. Yeah. Hey, they're ganged up in here. I think we got them. Okay. All right. Hey, we're, folks, we're hooking these fish today on an active presentation with a fast-moving bait. Here we're using a crankbait. But as the water cools off in the fall, and this migration continues, and as the migration ends, these fish are going to start dropping down deeper as the water cools to about 48 degrees then you're going to have to go to live bait and go down after them. And here's a thumbnail guide relating baits to water temperature that will help you pick what presentation to use when. During the beginning of the fall transition, when water temperatures are above 55 degrees, smallmouths love fast-moving horizontal lures. But as water temperatures cut through the mid-50s, slower, deeper presentations come into play. Finally, as the water gets to 50 degrees and below, live bait enhanced presentations become increasingly necessary to dig out these now reluctant biters. Make the needed adjustments and you'll catch fish right up to and into winter. We've got a horse on here. Oh. Better size one than that. Whoa, that was a good one, Jimmy. fall migration, you'll see some of the largest concentrations of bass you'll see throughout the entire year. In the angling world, a true honey hole is a valuable thing. A spot where you can catch big fish of many different species, a spot that performs consistently year to year, season to season. Rare? Precious, you say? Yes, maybe, but perhaps not as hard to find as you might think. If you live near a river system, most likely you're close to such a honey hole. That is, as close as the nearest dam and the tailwater section beneath it. We join in fisherman Doug Stangy as he unlocks some of the secrets of this often overlooked hotspot. I 
these are some tough fish. You know, as you're going to see here today, the setting here might not be so beautiful, but the fishing is just great. And I don't care any place you are across the country, when you find a damned, a damned situation like this, and you've got current reversing itself, in this particular case you've got rocks, you're going to find lots of fish. It's a simple fishing situation. The key is reading the current spots. And then, of course, it depends on the species of fish that you have to be after. I think that we'll probably get a few walleyes back in here. But for the most part, given where we're at, given the rock, rocky conditions that we've got right here, we're going to be after smallmouth bass. So stick around. Hey folks, when fishing a tail race, keep in mind that current's the great organizer. Current clearly defines areas that fish can comfortably function in. Current also moves and concentrates baits, both dead and alive. Fish set up in predictable patterns. Most fish tend to stage in relatively slack water areas when resting. But once they begin feeding, they move to the edges of current breaks to slip out and into the flow to intercept meals. These edges can be created by shoreline points protruding into the flow, by boulders, by pilings from the dam, or downstream wing dams. The washout hole below the dam apron may also produce a current break. The friction created when water passes over the bottom creates a zone of relatively slow water that fish use. What we've got right here, of course, is probably one of the key spots, maybe the spot that you should begin your fishing at the dam. You see the fast water shooting out of the dam, and then you've got this eddy area created by this volume of water sweeping around and then coming back into the fast water. But where that corner's together, that's got to be the beginning point. That's got to be where you start your fish. There's one right there. Ha <laughs> ha He doesn't like this very much. <laughs> there. Well, he didn't like getting hooked on that one, I can tell you that. They're getting bigger all the time, too. This one's got to be about two and three quarter, almost three pounds. but it's sure fun. like that for power and excitement. There seems to be plenty of them here too, I'll tell you that. Other factors influence how fish behave in tail races. Generally, colder water, which lowers the fish's metabolism, moves the fish into slack water eddies that form behind objects. Warmer water, on the other hand, moves fish towards current. In some cases, they may even roam in the relatively heavy flow in search of a meal. When the dam has lots of water flowing through, fish also seek the relative calm of eddy areas, or they will move downstream to more placid water. When the dam is only partially open, fish move tighter to main current areas. And if the dam is almost closed, there's almost no current, in other words, fish spread out and become more difficult to find. Obviously, current is a key factor for anglers fishing in tail race areas. You know, some people think that a crankbait like this, well, it, I don't want to say exactly that it doesn't take a lot of intelligence to fish, but it's really, really simple. And I have to agree with that, but there's some tricks to working crankbaits. Oh, right here! Huh? But 
I was about to say about the crankbait is that, you know, there's a lot of different kinds. In this situation, you want to get deep fast and you want to stay right down there. Uh, to do that, of course, you want to match the line to the crankbait and uh, about 10 pound test line would be a good option in this situation. Because of all the rocks, though, I've gone to about 12. That'll keep me a little shallower, but I won't lose any fish just because they nick against rocks. Sand. Crankbait, of course, fish get in these spots like this, and that crankbait can represent almost anything. It can be a crayfish, it can be a little shad, it could be an eelwife, it just depends where you're at. That's why the crankbait is so versatile in this kind of this kind of situation. Now, after you've worked a corner like this, what you want to do is check just downstream. Anything that sticks out into the current as you're moving down river. So we're gonna check all the next 200, 300 yards down. Again, looking for little points sticking out into current, something that breaks current. Yeah, any obstruction in the downstream flow is potential fish country. Dams in the tailwater area beneath them are a real fish magnet. In fact, they're the closest thing I know to a guaranteed honey hole. Give them a try. You know, rivers like this and smallmouth bass actually go hand in hand. I know for a fact the best smallmouth fishing in the entire North American continent exists in rivers and streams like this. Big smallmouth and numbers. It's the finest smallmouth fishery there is. You know, smallmouth bass that live in rivers, as a matter of fact, any fish that lives in rivers, their activity, location, and movement is based on one thing and one thing only, water levels. Raising water or lowering water. That's a fact. What we're going to do is head down river. I'm going to start fishing a few eddies and talk about how water levels determine smallmouth location, activity, in fact, even a presentation, the kind of lures you use. When you use a crankbait, a jig, or one of the more productive smallmouth baits that I like, a simple inline spinner like this Vibrex that account for so many smallmouths all over the country. If you fish rivers, you're going to learn something today that's going to put more smallmouths in a boat for you. First of all, let's talk about high water conditions because that's simply what I'm faced with here. The general reaction of any fish that lives in a river is to head toward sources of current during high water. This could be up toward the dam, the mouth of a feeder creek, or a pinch down area between islands that cause a funnel area that push water through it. Sources of current are really important. It draws fish like a magnet during high water conditions. Another thing that I recommend during high water is to anchor up on the positions that you plan to fish. They're usually very pinpointed and very specific. You don't have to cover a lot of water. You're fishing a distinct designated area. Fish move long distances to get to sources of current. They're more aggressive when these conditions occur. During high water conditions, they'll move up towards the bank. Concentrate your fishing efforts on the bank itself or on the flats that lead up to the bank, you can fish as far out as the first drop-off area. In other words, if there's a shallow area from the bank to five foot of water, and it drops fast from five to 25 foot, that's your first drop-off area. The fish will concentrate on the drop-off, the flats, and be right up on the bank itself. Whoa! 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 Oh. There. Whoa. Oh. Whoa, beautiful fish. Uh. Whoa. Uh. Whoa. Yeah. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Is a trophy. Woohoo! Look at that. Huh? There.
When we're talking high water, remember one thing. I'm meaning high, stable water or slow rising water, not instant flood stage water that just pours into these shallow water trees and brush. The other thing during high water is the overall activity level of the fish is to become more active or aggressive. And believe me, they're really aggressive today. Now during low water, you get a complete different reaction of the fish. The fish tend to move downriver away from the sources of current. Their activity level tends to slow down. In fact, they become almost neutral or negative. Not aggressive, not on a bite. They'll leave the actual bank area itself. Some fish will remain on the flats. Some fish will always remain on the first drop -off. A lot of fish move way down river to the basin areas and seek out the first deep, big hole that they can find. Huh? Ooh. Yes, folks, water level and water fluctuation determines how any fish, not only smallmouth bass, tend to react in rivers. They don't have a choice. They're a creature of necessity. Oh, man, did that, did that fish hit that thing right on the current break. <laughs> Boy, those small, look at that fish. Ooh. Oh, beautiful. Beautiful. It's gonna rush again. And fish are so fast in that river, I can't even lift her out of there. They bulldog down in that, that current. Oh, man. Look at that smallie. Oh. Woo. You talk about power. Pure power. Add one of the most powerful fish that swims, put it in some current. And they don't ever, ever, ever quit. <laughs> you had it yet? Okay, let's see if I get a thumb on this one. Whoa. Ah, all right. Ah, that is exciting, exciting fishing. Ah, boy, those little hooks really lock them down solid. That smallmouth got to go four and three quarters, maybe five pound fish. River smallmouth like this can be had anywhere in the country. And as long as you understand the principles of water fluctuation and how fish like this have to react to rising or lowering water. Smallmouth bass. No matter where you fish for, lake, river, reservoir, pit, or pond, no matter when you fish for them, spring, summer, or fall, the smallmouth will always give you a tussle for your money, absolutely guaranteed. This species' value as a game fish has convinced many folks within its range that it is indeed a fish worth more in the water than on the table. With a few exceptions, such as injured or otherwise unreleasable fish, we here at InFisherman heartily agree. And though we love to catch almost anything that swims, the smallmouth has become somewhat of a mascot to us here. For the reasons we've just outlined in this program, we truly respect the species that much. If you'd like to learn more about the smallmouth bass, get yourself a copy of our book on the subject. It's guaranteed to help you catch more fish more consistently. Write Smallmouth Book, Post Office Box 999, Brainerd, Minnesota 56401, or call 218-829-1648. Other titles that exist in the In Fisherman video treasury of angling wisdom are In Fisherman Classics. 
You know, for years, you've been hounding us to make our award-winning television shows available in home video form. Well, we're doing that and a whole lot more. The In Fisherman Classics takes you back to the beginning of In Fisherman Television and guides you right up to the present. It's a chronicle of events that shape the course of modern angling. Oh, there he is, John. <laughs> the Tactics and Strategy series consists of the same kind of hard-hitting action and entertainment provided by the award-winning television specials while delivering the most in-depth educational how-to fishing ever laid down on video. These tapes are guaranteed to set the standard by which all others are judged. The Discovery Year series takes a documentary approach, species-specific, providing you with an expanded view of the foundations of modern freshwater fishing, electronics, fish behavior, structure, precision boat control, a comprehensive look at the factors responsible for bringing lures and rigging design into the modern age of angling. Our travel and adventure series brings you the whens, wheres, and hows concerning the in fishermen's most exciting field trips. It provides you with material both to fuel your wildest dreams and to more confidently plan your trip of a lifetime. Look at the size of that thing! For more information, write In Fisherman Video, Post Office Box 2676, Brainerd, Minnesota 56401.